Thank you for the opportunity to talk this afternoon. Um, I'm Brent Brian with Blue Racer Midstream, Vice President of Business Development. That is a tough act to follow. Uh, I, that's probably who your keynote speaker was. I'm just following up after that with a presentation about uh, the Marcellus and the Utica production and how that relates to the midstream industry and, and also to uh, manufacturing ultimately in the Appalachian region and also uh, throughout the U.S. I was asked, as the title says, I was asked to discuss market development of the Marcellus resources. I added in the Utica to the title, because I think that uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Utica and, the, and how that underlies the Marcellus, especially in the northern part of West Virginia, and I think that it's important to uh, talk about both those resources, because there's, there's an amazing opportunity there with both those resources. Okay, there we go. All right, I'm sure that most of you cannot read this. Uh, this is uh, your standard forward-looking statement, in other words, don't use my presentation as any basis for any of your investments. Oops. Hang on a second here, we got technical difficulties. Can you guys see that? Okay, we'll try not to do that again. Okay, I have four topics that I wanna to talk about during the presentation today. As I said uh, just a minute ago, I want to talk about the Marcellus and Utica production and kind of give an update on where those production numbers currently sit. I'm not going to make a whole lot of forecasts because, as you'll see as I go through the presentation, there's a number of headwinds that exist out there for the Marcellus and the, and the Utica shale. Um, and likewise, then, for us midstream industries that are providing services for those producers uh, as we go forward. I'm going to also talk about um, this production as a manufacturing process. Uh, I think that we are beyond the stage of exploration. I think there's a good understanding of where the Marcellus Shale is at, where the Utica Shale is at, uh, and there's a really a change in a development towards trying to get the cost down and trying to maximize uh, return on investment from these, uh, from these shale plays. I'm going to talk then about the midstream industry and how our relationship as a midstream company uh, and how we work together with exploration and production companies, and then ultimately how that product that moves out of our pipelines and out of our plants uh, make it to ultimately to end users, whether that's here locally or projects that are looking to take this uh, throughout the United States and possibly throughout the world. Um, that kind of leads into my topic number four, the, where are these outlets for these products um, and what projects are out there currently to try to take these uh, to end users. And then and, uh, a shameless plug for Blue Racer Midstream, uh, the company that I work for, to kind of give you an idea of what we're uh, up to these days. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about the Marcellus and, and Utica gas and NGL productions. I grabbed this map from a range resources presentation and, and usually when somebody gives a presentation on the Marcellus and the Utica shale or any shale play, they just put the big map up there that shows the number of states that have the potential for that shale formation to be um, a deposition underneath the, uh, underneath the states. And this is an interesting map because what they've attempted to do in this map is to look at gas in place. So where is the most amount of gas? And then on top of that, they've not only looked at just the Marcellus or just the Utica, but they've also uh, added in the Upper Devonian, uh, which is a similar depositional period as the Marcellus, but is another separate production horizon that producers have recently been drilling horizontal uh, test wells in and have been showing uh, promising results so far. So when you look at this, especially in the northern panhandle of West Virginia, some of the best gas in place numbers exist right here uh, in the state of West Virginia. So moving on from that map, I wanted to talk just about where we currently sit from a production standpoint. The Utica is approaching or just above two BCF a day of uh, production, but the real giant in, in the area is the Marcellus Shale. Uh, Marcellus Shale is, is tipping over 16, pushing 17 million, or 17 BCF a day of production. And I think just yesterday I read in Gas Daily that the combined Marcellus and the Utica were almost at 20 BCF a day of gas uh, production. And, and that's pushing towards 30% roughly of U.S. total natural gas supply. So to go from, as you can see, fairly small numbers in 2007 of production to where we are at today is pretty astounding. Um, this growth obviously continues to exceed expectations if you go back a couple years to uh, projections of uh, volumes from the Marcellus. Nobody had projected that the volumes are going to be this large this quickly. 
Um, and so the question really, as I go through the next couple of slides, is will this growth continue? Uh, there are some headwinds ahead. Uh, but still, still talking about just the, the massive size of the Marcellus shale and the combined Marcellus and, and Utica potential. This is an article from a year ago uh, from Platts Gas Daily, which is an industry publication uh, that, that um, has a number of articles about production and downstream, upstream pipelines, et cetera. This was from uh, March 12th of 2014. And a year ago, if you looked at the Marcellus, just as a country, so assume that West Virginia, Pennsylvania, the Marcellus area was its own separate country, that the amount of gas being produced a year ago um, put it just behind Norway, Canada, Iran, and Qatar. And within the last year, the combination of the Marcellus and the Utica and their growth now to almost 20 BCF a day has put them, has put the two plays ahead of all those other countries. And pretty close, actually, from a production standpoint and gas production behind the state of Texas. So Texas uh, may have invented and, and developed the horizontal drilling and the fracturing techniques, but the Marcellus Shale, combined with the Utica Shale, hold some of the best opportunities for the implementation of those techniques and for the development of the resource. I don't think that gets enough press. I mean, when you think about what the shale and what the Marcellus and Utica Shale can, could represent if it was a separate country, that, that's some serious... Um, resource power and some serious um, uh, gas uh, production that um, really is beneficial to the area's economy and to the United States. Moving kind of down a little deeper, I wanted to, to segment this up just to the wet Marcellus and to the wet Utica uh, production. So this is gas that in addition to having methane has heavier hydrocarbons and requires processing in order to be able to uh, be sold or to, for the purity products to be removed. Um, the Marcellus um, production will increase by, from about 100 million barrels of liquids in 2012 to over uh, 600, 000, or 600 uh, million barrels per day by 2018. Ethane has a number of outlets. Uh, the pipelines were built um, partially as an insurance policy to give the ethane some place to go. Uh, obviously, the ethane is going to come up with the natural gas, so in order for the natural gas to be produced, uh, ethane and, and other uh, heavy hydrocarbons are produced and there is a need to be able to move that ethane or you can't move and produce the natural gas. Uh, so you have Mariner West that heads up to Sarnia, Canada. You have the Mariner East pipeline that goes to Marcus Hook and then you have the Atex pipeline that goes to, down to Mount Bellevue. Um, most producers these days, if they can, are trying to leave as much of the ethane in the natural gas stream as they possibly can and sending that to a burner tip someplace as opposed to recovering ethane. Uh, the value of the ethane at this point and the cost to get it to Mount Bellevue or other places where that ethane can be used, uh, the, the cost of transportation significantly uh, reduces the overall value of the ethane. So, um, propane is uh, C3 um, and then butane is C4. So basically propanes, butanes, natural gasolines, they're quickly exceeding local market demands. And as you'll see in some future slides that I have here, I'm, I'll show some uh, proposed pipelines and some other routes that are being looked at to try to help move that product to end users as well. So three key items that I want to hit on in the Utica and the Marcellus play uh, economics. So or, or just in general, what some of these headwinds may be for the production of these molecules going forward. This graph shows that the Utica wet gas, uh, the Marcellus shale super rich, so that's in the northern panhandle of West Virginia, and then the uh, Marcellus Shale uh, Liquids Rich, which is a little bit south there in the Wetzel and, and down into a uh, little, a few uh, southern counties there, are, are still, from this graph, are some of the most economical plays. 71% um, rate of return, 59, 57% rate of return. The problem with this slide is that this was put together in October of 2014 and assumes an $80 barrel crude oil and a $3.60 uh, MMBTU per MMBTU for natural gas. Uh, currently, sub $50 per barrel for oil, and locally, as low as $1.50 on Dominion South Point or on the Tech Co Zone 2 for natural gas. So commodity prices that showed a 71% rate of return or a 50-some percent rate of return in October of 2014 have almost halved. And so uh, it doesn't take long to understand that the economics of these plays uh, have definitely reduced. Now, I don't think that it just from a, from a uh, commodity pricing standpoint, it should reduce most of these across the board. Obviously, some of these plays may have a better access to a higher priced natural gas. 
uh, than maybe we have here locally with how much natural gas we're producing from the Marcellus and the Utica. But in general, all of production is looking at some type of slowdown, some type of reduction in investment because of just how successful they have been at finding hydrocarbons and producing hydrocarbons. So that's one item to consider. Um, and that kind of just plays into my slide here. This shows from 2009 until 2014, oil and natural gas prices really in the last six months to nine months have really taken a dive and have lost 50% or more in the overall commodity prices. The good news is, or maybe one of the things that can help overall reductions in commodity prices is trying to reduce your overall costs. Uh, and really, the producers are moving from exploration companies and from the east side to the production side. They have a good understanding of where the best parts of the formation are. Uh, and they have developed technologies and abilities to be able to drill multiple lateral wells from the same well pad. You then add on top of that the potential in certain areas, like for instance in Marshall or Wetzel County of West Virginia, where there exists the potential of four stacked horizontal or horizons where there's natural gas that can be drilled and produced. And it's amazing to think that with a large enough pad that you could potentially drill 32 wells from one pad and that you could then produce that gas um, and be more of a manufacturing process than really just dropping one or two laterals and testing the formation and running a lot of pipe and a lot of equipment just for a small amount of gas. An example, recently, I think it was a week or two ago, I was reading that, that Cabot Oil and Gas up in the northeast uh, area of Pennsylvania had drilled a well pad in the Marcellus Shale. And from that one well pad, they were producing um, 200,000 MCF a day. Now, to put that into perspective, that's more gas from one well pad than the entire state of Ohio produced in 2012. So, there, so the, the, the ability of the producers to find the gas, to, to focus in on the core areas, to drill multiple laterals at one location and then produce the gas is definitely bringing costs down, um, probably for them from a per unit cost of drilling wells, but it's also had, as you can see, an impact on natural gas prices as well. One other slide that I wanted to throw in here was even at these lower prices, um, natural gas is still playing a profound role in Appalachia's economic development. Uh, this is a graph that's called the Mountain State Business Index, uh, put together by West Virginia University Bureau of Business and Economic Research. And every month they, they, they publish these numbers. And as you can see in what I've tried to circle or tried to box in in red there in the graphics, is that while some of the other areas may experience small growth or you know, may, may have slumped in the last couple of months, uh, and a quote from Brian Lego at the, uh, at the research group, is that natural gas is still one of the driving items for economic growth, uh, not only in West Virginia, but in Pennsylvania and Ohio and in the Appalachian region as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now, for those of you in the room that may not be as familiar with the midstream industry, how the midstream industry operates, so our relationship with the exploration and production companies, some of the um, assets that we build, um, how they're critical to helping the producers get their product from a well pad uh, to an end user, and then ultimately um, how, how those um, purity products uh, make it to places where they can be consumed. It's a little bit of a busy diagram, but this shows the, the close relationship with the EMP industries and with the midstream industry. It takes a lot of capital and a lot of resources to drill a well to be able to get to that 200 million a day of production at one well pad. And then once that commodity is, is drilled and being produced, it takes a, a, quite a bit of other infrastructure, pipelines, gas processing plants, uh, NGL pipelines, fractionation facilities, if they're producing oil, uh, stabilization facilities, crude oil gathering pipelines, maybe it's moved by truck, uh, plenty of storage both on the gas side, NGL side, and on the oil side, and then ultimately what we would call either interstate pipelines for natural gas or for purity product pipelines uh, to move that product to an end user. And midstream can be everything within those brackets there. Uh, we, as a midstream provider, some producers, we go all the way to the well pad and we pick up the gas at the well pad. Uh, other producers will build their own small gathering systems, uh, or in this case, maybe a large gathering system, put together a compression facility, and then compress that gas into us, and then, then we move it. But um, it's a unique relationship with each one of our producers as to what uh, services that they need and what services uh, we provide. 
kind of a similar ma or a similar diagram to kind of so show what the midstream assets are. And really what I was trying to, to show in, on the right-hand side of this graph is you have two really types of gas that are produced in the Marcellus and in the Utica Shale. You have a dry gas, which typically meets interstate gas quality requirements. So what does that mean? Typically the gas is below 1,100 BTU, right around 1,100 BTU. Predominantly the majority of the gas stream is methane. Uh, maybe a little bit of ethane, a little bit of propane, and some heavy hydrocarbons. But really, in, with a well like that, you need some pipelines, possibly some compression, uh, measurement equipment, some dehydration equipment. That gas can be put right into an interstate pipeline or right into a local distribution company pipeline and can go to an end user and be burned. Uh, what most producers have been focusing on uh, in, the, in the Marcellus, especially in the West Virginia area and in Ohio in the Utica Shale, have been what they call wet or rich natural gas. And so this is gas that has 1,200, 1,250 BTU or higher uh, gas composition. In addition to methane, it has a, a large portion of ethane, propane, butane, um, and natural gasolines. This requires a significant, uh, significantly more capital investment from processing, fractionation, uh, purity pipelines, NGL pipelines, um, everything that's necessary to be able to separate the heavy hydrocarbons out of the natural gas and extract all the value that you can from the entire stream. And until recently, when NGL prices have um, dropped quite a bit, this, has, this wet gas has created the most value for producers uh, and why they've been drilling those wells. Our relationship as a midstream company can change day to day or uh, month to month with the exploration and production companies. The exploration and production companies are constantly evaluating what products do they expect to produce from their wells and how much. They're evaluating does the infrastructure exist when they go to drill a well? Uh, can they quickly get a well online? Can they quickly start flowing that well? And then ultimately, can they make any money from the product once it's been produced? And depending on where we are as a midstream sector in building out facilities, depending on where the producer is and understanding the formation and what the product is that could be produced from the well, and then ultimately, depending on end users and what, where that product's going to go and how much they can sell it for, it can change from day to day and, and month to month as to exactly where, uh, where their most profitable return is and where they're focusing. So we, as a group, have to stay in constant communication with the exploration and production companies. Um, these investments can be expensive, so they require a lot of economies of scale. Um, high capital costs have, uh, especially associated with pipelines, with processing plants and fractionations, have really segmented the industry up to the, the upstream group, uh, the exploration and production industry, the midstream, like myself and, and our company, Blue Racer Midstream, who's building pipelines, processing plants, fractionation facilities. And then the downstream pipeline who's building takeaway pipelines, whether that's a purity products propane pipeline or an ethane pipeline, or that's an interstate uh, natural gas pipeline. Uh, these economies of scale um, have, have required sometimes joint ventures. Uh, as I'll talk about a little bit later, Blue Racer is a joint venture between Dominion Resources and Cayman Energy. Uh, where we were able to take and bring assets and capital together to try to build an opportunity out of those existing assets and the access to, to uh, capital to continue to develop those assets. I'm going to dive down a little bit further. This may be a little elementary for some folks that are in the audience, but I wanted to talk about just some of the individual pieces. Uh, a wellhead starts out uh, where a producer has either uh, planned to drill a well location or has drilled a, a well. It could be multiple pad or multiple laterals, or it could be a single lateral. Pipelines typically gather that gas um, and typically gather oil or condensate other oil, and condensate can be moved by truck as well um, to a processing plant. It could move through a compressor station on its way there, um, but that is one of the integral or one of the first pieces that a midstream company needs to install. We have somewhere around, and it might be a little bit less than this now as some of our construction work has slowed down a little bit, we have about 900 construction workers currently working in Ohio and West Virginia for Blue Racer Midstream, digging ditches, welding pipe, installing pipe, uh, restoring right-of-ways, cutting trees be, uh, before we work on the pipeline installation, as you kind of see in this picture here. Once that gas gets into a gathering pipeline and to a compressor station, then it moves um, if it's wet gas and needs to be processed, it moves to a processing plant. This is a photo of a, our burn processing complex that's in Monroe County in Ohio. Um, the gas is brought there 
run through a cryogenic process where it's super cooled. And basically at this plant, it's separating methane from all the other heavy hydrocarbons. And we have between our construction work at our fractionation facility in um, Natrium, West Virginia, and this processing plant that we have over in Ohio, we have about 250 construction workers currently uh, installing, putting together these skid packages, uh, doing dirt work, um, pouring foundations for these skids to sit on and to connect all the pipelines that are coming in and out of the facilities. So it, it combined with just with contract workers, in addition to the 150 or so employees that we have at Blue Racer Midstream, we have over a thousand contractors out there currently installing pipelines and building facilities. In addition to all of the um, employees that are out there working for the EMP companies to drill and complete these wells. Once the gas is cryogenically processed and the heavy hydrocarbons are separated from the natural gas, we take it to our fractionation facility and we, in our fractionators in Nature in West Virginia. And uh, we then take it through a distillation tower, essentially. You're heating those products back up and separating out ethane, propane, butanes, and pentanes. And, and as I've included on this, uh, on this um, graphic, um, ethane, for the most, uh, most part, is, is moving out of our plant, either blended back into the gas stream or it's going through a purity products pipeline up to ATEX, uh, which is then ultimately making its way back down to the Mount Bellevue and down to the Gulf Coast in Texas. Propane is spread between res local residential market, um, petrochemical demand, and uh, commercial, industrial, and agricultural use. And as I talked about earlier, and I'll show on a later slide, uh, there are projects being developed right now to give increased propane and butane takeaway capabilities out of the Appalachian region to other areas of the United States where the propane can be consumed and to try to move it via pipe as opposed to move it by rail or to move it by truck, which is the current uh, methods that we're primarily moving our propane out of our fractionators today. Butanes um, uh, feeding petrochemical stock uh, can be used for um, ethanol blend stock. Uh, pentanes, most of our natural gasoline at this point is moving via rail up to uh, Western Canada and being used as a diluent uh, to help uh, dilute uh, tar sands uh, to allow that um, heavy oil to be able to move in a uh, pipeline. I talked about this in a couple slides ago. Um, Midstream has a definite influence on employment in the area. Um, we have a number of uh, materials and suppliers that are, that are local. We hire um, environmental health and safety specialists, uh, right-of-way specialists, inspection specialists, as well as uh, to the extent that you can bid and purchase um, equipment uh, locally, you can help from a cost standpoint, you can help from a timing standpoint, and you can help create competition. I wanted to throw some logos up here of some of the manufacturing uh, companies that we work with uh, to provide some of our equipment. I think it's important for the audience to understand that um, we are buying a number of products, whether it's a compressor unit or a primary driver that's, that's running the compressor uh, from Caterpillar and from Ariel. Uh, we buy fractionation and stabilization facilities from Enerflex, uh, from Exterin, uh, Exterin and UOP Russell are primarily the two manufacturers of the processing skids that are used locally. Um, there's been probably approximately 30 processing skids that have been installed to date across the Appalachian region, and I'll show you here on a map in a couple slides where those have been installed at. Um, and then in addition, there's probably been about 15 fractionation skids that have been installed um, since about 2007, 2008. Uh, we use some local packagers uh, to assemble and, and, to, and to build compressor skids, uh, measurement skids, um, other equipment that we need um, for uh, measuring producer's gas or moving producer's gas for us. I'm trying to catch up here on my slides. A couple slides to talk about processing capacity and production. I showed you earlier on where the production was currently sitting for the overall play. I wanted to dive down a little bit into the wet and to the... Uh, wet production versus production capacity uh, that we are primarily focused on as a midstream provider. And as you can see from this graph, right now, uh, planned production and processing capacity is, is about matching up. Um, there was a, definitely an attempt in the Utica side of the play to get out in front of production and to try to get facilities constructed. And it's forecasted so far based on where the planned construction, where construction currently sits and where planned construction is in the next five years should be able to meet the producer's needs from a processing standpoint. Um, what I've shown here, and it may be hard to see in the background, um, 
the Ohio, uh, you should be able to see the Ohio River there and then Ohio, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. But you can see there's been a, across the entire wet or rich Marcellus and then across the rich Utica, there's been a number of processing plants that have been scattered or built across that area to provide processing services for the producers. And then in the bottom half of each of those call out tags are um, either to be determined or future facilities to be constructed at those locations. So uh, quite a bit of stations that have been built, like I said, about 20 skids have been installed and probably if you count up, there's probably 10 or so more that are planned in the next couple of years as the producers continue to, to drill the wells and to build out their volumes. Fractionation capacity as an industry, midstream has been a little bit behind in building fractionation capacity. We've probably been a little more just in time as opposed to building out ahead of um, on a fractionation. Some of that is driven by ethane. Um, at this point, producers prefer, if they can, to leave the ethane in the gas stream and to sell it as a gas molecule. So some of the overproduction of NGLs or the potential overproduction of NGLs and the lack of fractionation is because we've not built a lot of deethanization facilities beyond what we felt we needed to build in order to be able to meet uh, interstate gas quality requirements. And then the remainder is trying to just uh, not to get too far out ahead of the producers on the fractionation side. These fractionators require storage, uh, rail loading facilities, quite a bit of investment, and they're not, um, they are definitely more expensive than installing a processing skid, so we try to do those a little bit more just in time. Uh, developing options, uh, there's been discussion from time to time about moving Y grade. So Y grade is the uh, mixed uh, liquids that come out of the processing plant, the combination of propane, butane, isobutane, and natural gasoline. There's been some discussion about sending that down to the Gulf Coast, to existing fractionators during the Gulf Coast. None of those projects have yet come to be, but it's potential that one still may surface as an economic alternative to building a fractionator locally. And just as I showed you on the processing skids, again, scattered across the rich Marcellus and across the rich Utica, you see a number of fractionation facilities that have either been built already or that are in the process of being uh, constructed. Uh, so a lot of investment from the midstream industry and in combination with the investments from the exploration and production industry to, to take all these molecules from the ground and to turn them into products that can ultimately be used by uh, end users. So this map is a... Um, is a map of all of the interstate pipelines. So these are all either pipeline projects to reverse pipelines, install compression, other facilities that are necessary to reverse pipelines, or new build pipelines uh, to go into service between 2014 and 2017. So as you can see, just as we've been really active from a midstream standpoint in building processing facilities and fractionators and wellhead gathering and compressor stations and everything necessary to get that product to a purity state. The interstates have been very active in putting together projects to try to move these uh, volumes of natural gas to end users. And I put this red line on this map kind of as a dividing line. Uh, essentially, everything that is to the east of that red line um, which predominantly is Marcellus production, is headed, and I'll show you on some of the later graphs here, some of the individual projects, is headed to the northeast for consumption in the northeast or is headed to the southeast for consumption um, in, in the southeast area. Everything to the west of that line is predominantly headed to either Canada, to the Midwest, or turning all the pipelines that were built to bring all that natural gas from the Gulf Coast up here to the Appalachian region as production volumes from conventional production continue to decline and uses continue to increase, to turning all those pipelines around and moving all that natural gas back down to Mount Bellevue. Uh, when that's whether to be used in the Texas um, Gulf Coast area or, and probably um, more importantly, for them to be able to access liquefaction facilities to be able to get onto ships and to be able to go international with the, um, with the liquid natural gas. So this first table shows between 2014 and 2018 all the northeast projects. So these are all the pipeline projects that are up to the east of that red line that I had on that map. And as you can see, the majority of them are headed to the northeast market, headed to Canada, and a few of them headed to the mid-Atlantic and the southeast. Obviously, some of these are being driven by coal conversions uh, to natural gas. Um, some of them being driven by uh, just the desire to get more natural gas in the northeast to replace propane or to replace uh, fuel oil. And then as you get on the other side of that red line that was on the map, the majority of those projects are taking gas, as I said, to the Midwest 
or ultimately to the Gulf Coast. Um, and a number of projects between now and 2018 to build out. So to, to kind of show you in summary, I'm showing 20 billion cubic feet of production currently from the Marcellus and, and the Utica shales. Um, kind of a question as to where that production was going to grow to. Is it going to grow to 22 and start to slow down? Is it going to grow to 25 to 30? Kind of somewhat unknown still with where commodity prices are. But there are already projects that are either um, firmed up and have not yet received FERC approval or have already received FERC approval and are starting to build pipelines to move 10 BCF a day out of the northeast or from the northeast uh, Marcellus production into uh, the northeastern part of the U.S. or down into the southeast. And then an additional 23 billion cubic feet of pipeline capacity either through conversions or new builds to take gas and to take it to the Midwest, to, to take it to Canada, to take it to the Gulf Coast. Um, a couple of small projects to take it to the northeast, but a total of 33 billion cubic feet. So the, the interstate industry is definitely trying to get out in front of all these volumes, and obviously the producers that are looking at $1.50 gas prices locally in Appalachia and looking at $3 gas prices at Henry Hub or $3 gas prices at Dawn in, in Michigan or looking at the Chicago market at $3 gas prices are saying, well, I'll pay 50 cents to try to get out to those markets. So the question is going to be is, are we going to hit 33 BCF with where prices have gone? And are they going to ever realize a $3 price or are they just going to export $1.50 gas prices to those other markets? Same question on NGLs. So with all these NGLs, propane, butane, um, natural gasoline, ethane that's getting produced, where are these products going to go? And it's a similar story. Uh, the, the local market is becoming saturated. Uh, with uses um, for those molecules. And so there are pipeline projects like Mariner West that's already completed that's taking 50,000 barrels a day up to a cracker up in Sarnia, Ontario. Uh, there's Mariner East 1 and 2, which is a combination of ethane and propane pipelines that are headed towards Marcus Hook and towards Philadelphia and ultimately towards loading those uh, propanes and, and butanes and ethane onto a ship and sending it international. ATEX was constructed, as I talked about earlier, to move ethane to the Gulf Coast. It's got 190,000 barrels of capacity. I'm sure there's much less than that that's flowing on there because the economics aren't the best right now to send those molecules down to the Gulf Coast, but it is there for the producers to be able to help them produce the rest of their natural gas out of the wells. And then some uh, projects that have been proposed, Utopia East, Utopia West, looking at additional ethane deliveries up to Sarnia or looking at taking uh, natural gasolines that are currently being railed to Canada and putting it in a more efficient process, putting it in a pipeline, getting up to Kinder Morgan's coaching pipeline, and then allowing it to move via pipeline all the way up to Western Canada. And then uh, this uh, Utica Marcellus, um, Texas pipeline um, is a combination of a batch service, Y-grade propane, butane, trying to look at do we have enough um, uh, NGLs that we need to look at getting those back down to Mount Bellevue, uh, the largest um, users of these NGLs. Quick couple slides on Blue Racer Midstream and then I'll follow up with some conclusions. As I said earlier, Blue Racer is a joint venture between Dominion and Cayman Energy. Uh, Dominion contributed a number of um, gathering pipelines and the Natrium Processing Complex. Cayman uh, brought um, experience uh, from build-outs in Cayman 1 in West Virginia, Marshall, and Wetzel County, as well as uh, private equity backing uh, to form a joint venture to look at opportunities to provide gathering and processing services for Utica and Marcellus producers. We have a gathering system that with expansions can gather as much as uh, 2 billion cubic feet a day. Currently, we have about 650 miles of gathering pipeline that spreads through a good portion of Ohio, but also um, connects down through Marshall and into Wetzel County of West Virginia. Uh, we have about 600 million a day of processing capacity. We have 47,000 barrels of frac and then some condensate gathering and stabilization facilities. We have another 200 million a day processing plant that's under uh, construction at Bern, um, and then one that's in the early stages of construction in Tuscarora's County in Ohio. With uh, 200 miles of additional gathering pipeline that's currently under construction and then a large frac expansion at Natrium that allows um, our fractionator to be expanded to handle up to six processing plants or 1.2 BCF a day of gas. Some of our connectivity right now from a pipeline standpoint, we have an ethane uh, pipeline that leaves our Natrium complex and goes up to Panhandle of West Virginia and connects to the uh, ATEX pipeline. Um, we also are working on a future connection with uh, Mariner East 1 uh, to be able to deliver volumes into Mariner East 1 as well. 
propane, all of our propane right now at the site moves via rail. We load propane onto our rail and we, and we move it onto trucks and we move it to the local market. If the local market's saturated, we move it on to Texas or on to the Midwest. We have um, been in discussions and working with uh, Mariner East 2, which is a purity products pipeline to take both propane and butane over to Marcus Hook uh, to allow for export opportunities. And that project is proposed to be completed by the end of 2016. Same situation on butane moves by rail and by truck currently, and we are working on pipeline outlets uh, for that locate for those uh, molecules. And then for our condensate production and for our natural gasolines, uh, that's primarily moving by rail uh, up to the Canadian market, and we do have the ability to load trucks uh, locally at the, the Natrium uh, Fractionator. Residue outlets, we're currently connected to Dominion Transmission, and via Eureka Hunter, we can connect to Texas Eastern and Rockies Express. So we offer a number of different pipeline outlets. In addition to having uh, worked closely with um, Energy Transfer, EQT, and with Columbia on trying to provide future outlets out of our Natrium complex for producers. Residue gas at the burn location over in Monroe County of Ohio is primarily goes, ties into TETCO. Are working on future expansions into Rover uh, uh, Energy Transfers Rover Pipeline as well as Rockies Express, and then Lewis is primarily Dominion Transmission and Tennessee Gas. So, in conclusion, I do too bad. Marcellus and Utica production has transitioned from exploration to development. In my opinion, I think it's looking more and more like a manufacturing process. Um, as I discussed on some of those slides, there's additional horizons that add upside. Uh, beyond just the Marcellus and the Utica uh, with the Upper Devonian, Rhine Street, the Burkhead formations. Production, at least if you look at history as an indicator for the future, is set to continue to grow even at um, current reduced oil and natural gas prices. Uh, even if we you know, go back and look at that slide with the rate of returns, it may not be a 70% rate of return, it may be a 40 or 30% rate of return, but it's still an attractive rate of return versus maybe where investment dollars may be able to go from an EMP standpoint and other plays. The midstream and the interstate assets are being actively constructed. As I showed you, a number of processing plants, number of fractionators, quite a bit of wellhead gathering pipeline, and the interstate's building you know, potentially 33 BCF a day of pipeline capacity to move this natural gas to other markets. This has obviously created manufacturing opportunities in some segments of the economy. Um, we've used this number before that there's probably 30 billion, maybe more, maybe a little bit less with where commodity prices are now that needs to be spent on infrastructure to continue to meet uh, these production needs. And so ultimately I'll leave it with the last question is, will this natural gas and, and the NGLs that are produced, will it feed and manufacturing and growth in Appalachia in, in the U.S. against the, uh, across North America or maybe across the entire world? Last slide, I'd like to follow up with uh, thanks to all of our customers. Uh, we have a number of producers that we work with uh, to build uh, sustaining and lasting relationships with to help them be able to move their gas uh, to the market. So it's always important for us to recognize who uh, uh, customers' uh, gas we're moving across our system. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for the opportunity.